Hello, everybody, and welcome to Fireside Paranormal Podcast. Thank you guys so much for joining me this week. Uh, my guest today is Matthew Jackson. He is with Paraholics.com. You guys are going to love him. Just a few things before we get to him. I do want to mention American Paranormal Magazine. Uh, their January issue just came out, and they did a full-page uh, highlight, I guess, of Fireside Paranormal Podcast and me. And it was really cool, you know, for that whole thing to happen. So make sure you check it out. You can go to their website, AmericanParanormalMag.org. And you can go, there's a print copy, it's like $9.99. There's a digital copy for three bucks. But definitely go check that out. They're, they have some really cool stories in there. Also, I want to give a really big shout out to all of our new uh, uh, Facebook group fans. We have had 1,200 new members in the last week. And everybody's been having a lot of fun. Everybody's posted and laughing and having a good time. So if you haven't joined the group yet, it's Fireside Paranormal Hub. If you've already joined, keep on being awesome. I love you guys. All right, let's get to our featured story. Our featured story today comes in from Wes. He's actually got two stories for us. Well, my name is Wes. I am from the greater Wheeling area. And I've got two fun stories to share with you today. One is paranormal as far as supernatural elements go. One is a little bit more natural as far as our furry friend Sasquatch goes. So I'll start with the ghost story. So this ghost story is interesting in that it does not start on a dark and stormy night. This ghost story starts when I was about seven years old, maybe eight years old, at our house, which was built, not previously owned, putting that out there. And um, it was during an early afternoon on a Saturday. Sunshine. Nothing, you know, no, like, you know, we usually think, oh, it's, it's a corner of that. Tr- you see something at night. Oh, you're fooling yourself. Well, me and my mom were hanging out. You know, we were watching probably like the Rambo cartoon or something. And she was just placating me. Being, you know, she was laying on the couch hitting this balloon. We were playing what we called Pat the Balloon. It's volleyball with the balloon. It was just an easy game. But anyway, uh, our home, there was the living room where we were. Then there, it was kind of, you could go, you could run all around the circle in these rooms. There was like the, the living room where we were, the foyer, there's a dining room and the kitchen, and you could just run through all three of those. So my mom just kind of sitting on the couch, just hits this balloon and it goes up, up and kind of twists around and goes into the foyer area. So, you know, I just run in to get the balloon, not thinking anything of it. It's a Saturday afternoon, sun's out, whatever. So I run in and I reach down and grab the balloon and I just look over my shoulder to the left and turn my head to the left. And on this three stair rise is a white shrouded figure, arms outstretched, robed in white, face, but blurry. And I froze and I could not move. I still get goosebumps thinking about it to this very day, even telling the story, even though it's been you know, more than 30 years since then. And I just froze. I could not move. And I just stared at it, and it was just simply there. Unmoving, arms outstretched, just there. Gone. It disappeared in the blink of an eye. It didn't fade away. It didn't, you know, do something fancy. And just, It was just all of a sudden, straight up, gone. And I went and told my mom about it and stuff, and I, I can't. I can picture it like I was there is how vivid that was. And again, Saturday morning, bright and sunny, I ran into one room, looked to my side, and there it was. It wasn't expecting me to run in there. What it was, I have no idea. It was extremely ghostly. And what's really funny is, even though ghosts are kind of like this kind of like very stereotypical shape of, oh, it's this white shrouded figure and this and that, that's, I, it's funny to me because, and it's interesting to me, interesting? because... Yes, it, like it was. It wasn't like dra- it was more like a robe, like a draped robe, and so like I see all these you know funny ghost things and stuff because I love creepy stuff, but there's a history in that. Why do ghosts always look like that? Why do people envision ghosts to look like that? And all this pop culture and all of our stories and things, because there's actually some truth to that, and that's so that's that's the best ghost story that I have. I it sticks it sticks me th- to this day like it was yesterday. Um, the other fun story that I got for you today involves our good friend Sasquatch, and uh, our friends and I and our we and our sons uh, were good friends, and we went out camping at Tappan Lake, 
local area, you know, and it was a beautiful late fall season. So not a lot of activity. There were hardly anybody even, there was hardly anybody even there. So we went, it was like probably late October, early November. We wanted to go camping at that time. You know, we wanted, we didn't want a lot of people to be there. And we did the primitive camping as well, too. So we're out there where it's like, you know, there's a spot that you can pull up to and put up your tents. It's not, you know, you're not in the middle of the woods, but there's no electricity out there. And we went through this very, there was a very long road that had this cul-de-sac at the end. You turn around. So all along this road, you could put up a camping spot, but nobody did because nobody was there. So we ended up, we went all the way to the end as far as we could because we wanted to get, you know, way buried in there. And so we set up our tents. We're having a good night. You know, nightfall came. We had a nice fire going. And the kids, the, you know, our kids were all younger at the time. They were taller than us almost now. But um, they had these crazy laser guns and things that were flashing red, white, and blue and stuff. And they were running around this area. And we were joking that, you know, from a distance it looks like some kind of UFO landing because they're running around this cul-de-sac in the dark with these flashing lights. Well, it may have been that that actually caught the attention of something because it was maybe about an hour later. The kid, We all kind of gathered. Everybody was around the fire. And we're just hanging out, and their dog was there with them and everything. And all of a sudden, we just hear this... I can't incredibly gruff bellowing sound through the valleys because we're kind of in the bottom of a valley there's a hill on one side there's a hill on the other and we're on this road just us down here in the bottom in between it went oh ho oh, 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 like that and our friend turns and looks at me and says what the bleep was that and I knew what that was and I just looked at her like Holy crap. You know, I mean, I understand. People could be out there on the calls. I, I get it. You know, I understand. Gruff. Gruff. I can't describe it, uh, it, it per, as, as well. I can never imitate it because it's so gruff. But anyway, their dog goes insane and runs over as far as it can to where the, bo the bottom of the hill lands. But there's a creek, and it can't cross over. And... A little, a little run, just a little run, nothing major. And it is barking, running back and forth, barking, barking, running back and forth because it can't get up the hill to what just made that sound. And then, so we we're like, whoa, that was intense because we, you know, we, we follow that kind of stuff. So we had an idea. And then uh, five minutes later, same thing on the other side of the hill, of the valley that we're staying in between. And uh, it... At that point, it was, everybody's going to bed. <laughs> one, our, one of our friends and I stayed up by the fire because we were extremely on edge at that point. Uh, but everybody else was just immediately like, we're in bed. We're, that's it. We're going to bed. And so it was very interesting. So it was extremely memorable. So it, And it, it was a, a fun night. And again, both of these kind of things happened very unexpectedly, which is kind of, you know, we weren't going looking for things. It just kind of happened to us. And that's what makes them so, like, wow. Yeah. But those, those are two, there's two good stories for you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Wes. And if uh, you would like your story featured on our show, make sure you email us at firesideparanormalpodcast at gmail.com. And I think it would be cool, even if you don't have a scary story, let's say you're in a paranormal investigation team out there that has some cool evidence or... Um, had a really cool experience and you don't necessarily have enough or, or brave enough to do an entire hour long show with me, but you, you definitely want to highlight one of the investigations you've been on. You can always send that in as well and reach out to me there and we can make your story a featured story on the show. We have an event coming up called Hidden Marietta Paranormal Exposition. In the ballroom of the haunted and historic Lafayette Hotel, we will gather together all those who delight in the supernatural. From hands-on activities to speakers teaching you the secrets of haunted objects and locations, they have a unique array of creepy creative merchandise and a lot of things to experience and learn. There will be tours of the Lafayette also available. 
Advance tickets are $12 per person. Tickets at the door are $15 per person. And this event is coming January 29th, 2022. And that is going to be an earlier show. It's going to be 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. I'm going to have a table set up to record your stories. It's going to be a lot of fun. Do a little meet and greet. Can't wait to see you guys there. All right, I want to get to our guest today. So join me by the fire as we welcome Matthew Jackson with Paraholics.com. Matt, you with us? Yes, I am, sir. How have you been? Uh, I've been really good. I've been really busy, but uh, I'm out here in the wilds of Indiana holding my own, man. Now, for those of you listening, uh, man, Matthew has been around quite a while with, with me and radio. You know, I think, uh, <laughs> how, how long ago have we talked? Dude, I mean, it's been it's been a minute. Um, you know, I was thinking back, and literally, Whispers Radio that you used to host with Lola, that was my first introduction ever into paranormal podcast. Oh wow! So, uh, I, I, yeah, I used to listen to you you guys all the time, man. It was it was my it was my favorite show back in the day. And then you ditched me. Oh god! <laughs> <laughs> now, now, are you one of the many that fell in love with Lola? Everybody, everybody I ever talked to, all of our emails, it was always about Lola. I may have been using you to get to her. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> yeah, she was she was wonderful on the show, man. <laughs> She's a blast. She's a blast. And I'm Yes. So Lola, if you're listening, I'll give you Matt's number. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. I know uh Matt, you've you know, you've been on the show with me before. You've uh you've sent in stories, you know, for Halloween episodes. Uh this past Halloween episode we had a story of yours that you'd sent in to me years ago. We we plugged it in there. I know you do a lot of work with uh like ITC work, right? Is that what you're into now? Yeah, I do. Uh, yeah, I, I, I really fell in love with uh, uh, ITC, Instrumental Transcommunication, and I'm uh, proud to say that I've, I've had really good working relationships with most of what I would call the boutique uh, box builders that are out there. And I've had the opportunity, I think, to own almost a box made by you know, every, every single builder out there. So I'm, I'm really well versed in the, uh, the ins and outs of most of those radios. And I, I know a lot of those, those, those builders personally. So it's, it's been a really cool ride over the past few years. Now we've had, uh, we had Steve and his wife, you know, Steve Holte, not too long ago on the show. You, you've done some work with him as well, right? Yeah. Katie and Steve, both. I, I have several, boxes made by Halte Paranormal and um, they're they're definitely some of my favorite go-to devices uh, they uh, have a really really unique smooth uh, sweep to them which anyone who does a lot of ghost box work you can appreciate when things are not super harsh especially in audio review or you're listening for responses in real time so it's it's really it's really nice to have devices like that on hand I was gonna put you on the spot and see who your favorite was <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I'm glad. Just well, to, just well, in case Steve was listening. If I if I could have a list of all the listeners out there, I will let them know that they're my favorite builders if they're, if they're on there. <laughs> <laughs> oh funny. Now, now, how long have uh, what got you in to the ITC? Because I I know it, it's kind of controversial sometimes in the in the investigation world. You know, what made you take mm -hmm. that leap? What what made you jump into it? Um, you know, years ago, I investigated with uh, a group of guys who, you know, they were kind of hot and cold on the whole ITC thing, uh -huh. which, which is fine. I mean, a lot of people are. And I, I, I bought a, um, a ghost box on my own. And I, at one point, I was at a location and it I had a direct intelligent reply that I couldn't deny because it actually said the homeowner's name plain as day. And, and I, and I know with ITC devices, you know, you get a lot of like radio bleed and different things like that. Uh, but at the same time, I don't think that we're in any position to say what a spirit may or may not be able to uh, manipulate as far as like in the course of our investigation. Uh -huh. So since we don't, we don't know the rules on how, 
they actually work and, and what they can or cannot do. Uh, I just became a little bit more open to the possibilities of, you know, what if this is legitimate? What if there is a way for them to communicate? And uh, it, it, it's kind of weird because people will have uh, um, all these ideas on do the spirits manipulate like the radio waves as they enter the device or the radio waves when it's inside the device. And but in some of my experimentation, I really feel like the paranormal aspect of it actually happens once the sound leaves the speaker of the device and the okay. reason i say that is because i have recorded the audio off of ghost boxes uh, onto a recorder that's directly piped into the ghost box and then i've also had a recorder uh, separately on in, in in the room uh, disconnected from the uh, the device just recording the sound and i've got a, i've gotten different uh, files when I go back and review them, like the the, uh, the the recorder that's in the room will have a reply that the uh, recorder that was connected to the ghost box did not have. That's so very I interesting. Think it happens. Yeah, I think it happens in real time and in that space. I don't think there's anything magical about the the radio waves and the the machine itself. I think the manipulation happens afterwards, and so to me, that's 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 incredible. And, um, and, you know, I, I, I just keep playing around and experimenting, like I said, these different devices. And I've gotten some really wild responses over the years. Now, is this different than like a uh, white noise machine? Like, because it, you're, you're kind of taking that, that sound energy that's already there and they're manipulating it afterwards. What would be the difference, mm -hmm. do you think? I think that um, when you're using a, a device that actually sweeps the radio, you're getting white noise and the static, and you're also getting, you know, some bleed through from the different, uh, you know, frequencies that have stations on it. And I think it just provides more material for the um, the spirit to manipulate. Okay. <clears throat> the uh, yeah, and, it's like a white noise box white noise. Uh, 2.0. Exactly. And, and I think that if you take uh, a go a radio and you just put it on a static station, which is essentially like a white noise generator, um, I mean, there's still potential there to get replies. Uh, and a lot of people are out there still working with direct radio voice, which I think is amazing. I think it might take a little bit more patience than like, um, uh, you know, when you're just using a regular ghost box. And I think the replies that you get through direct radio voice um, are are harder to debunk um so i have a lot of respect for that that type of work too i just haven't had the opportunity or taken the time to really experiment with that a lot now i am not you know when when i had steve and and katie on that is the first time i had really heard much about itc so this is all this is all a new kind of realm for me what is direct radio oh okay uh, direct radio voice is essentially like you were talking about with uh, like a white noise generator. Uh, it's where somebody takes a lot of the, especially the, I think over in Europe, this has been more of a common approach to ITC work uh, where you just basically take a radio and you set it to a station that there's no, or a frequency that where there is no station. So okay. it's just white noise okay. and, and voices come through and <clears throat> you do just like a, a, a regular, like a ghost box session, but you're just not sweeping the, uh, the, the radio band. It's stationary. And, you know, it's, there's a lot of researchers out there where they've documented these replies coming through. Very cool. Now, do you, Yeah. because you still do investigations, do you find yourself gravitating more towards like a ghost box than just a recorder? Do you try to do a little bit of both? Like, is there, is one your go-to? How does that work for you? It, you know, it's funny because, uh, I'm, I'm kind of a stickler when it comes to, uh, investigations even though i love ghost boxes i still want like cooperative evidence i i want you know different pieces of data coming from different sources uh that that make that add up to a paranormal experience so if i go into a space and i just turn on a ghost box and i don't have any personal experiences and i don't have any uh you know my emf meters light up and if I don't catch any EVPs, all I get is ghost box replies. I'm typically not satisfied. 
So to okay. me, the golden standard with, with anything is just a regular EVP from a recorder. If I can't get an EVP uh, with just a recorder, a ghost box coming through and, and the way that you can get a lot of fa false positives that way, you know, make everything feel really like kind of hollow or shallow to me as far as like the weight of the, uh, the data that I'm going to present to people. So I always focus on EVP work and I still, you know, I put out meters. I, I love my, my tri-field meter, you know, I set all these things out and I still go through those steps and even though I'm an ITC guy, the ghost box is usually my, my, I don't want to call it my final resort, but it's usually the last piece I try to add to it. So that's kind of like the pecking order that I go through in almost every investigation. So uh, I, I will go and just do like cemetery sessions sometimes where I'm there just to, um, experiment with ghost boxes. So that's still different to me than when I go on an investigation, you know, at a location. So when you're at a cemetery, and this is a question I have for you, and I have somebody else that I have booked in February that one of his primary things he does is go out to cemeteries with ghost boxes. Uh, mm -hmm. Why? What What do you find there? Is, is it an active area? I always thought that cemeteries, although spooky and creepy feeling, weren't necessarily so active. But is that is that not the case? Well, if you just look around and you look at all the, what I like to call ghost lore, uh, that's out there, especially here in the Midwest, there's always stories of haunted cemeteries. So what makes a cemetery haunted? I mean, I really, I really can't qualify, uh, um, you know, that, but if people have experiences there, why not go and, and check them out? You know, um, I, I don't know if it's some weird attachment that a, a spirit would have to its body or its grave or, or what, uh, you could explain that, but, uh, I've, I've had lots of really interesting exchanges uh, in, in a lot of the cemeteries that I've been to. And one of the things that I always do, well, first off, I, I don't go to like modern cemeteries. I always go to, uh, you know, a, a historic cemetery simply okay. because I don't want to seem exploitive over you know someone's grandma who just you know passed away uh mm. two months ago I, yeah. I never ever ever do that so even if i go to a cemetery i always find out like the old section and um uh, because i figure if somebody's great great grandpa you know pops forward that family's probably gonna have less heartstrings attached to him versus, yeah, versus you know disease. somebody uh yeah recent so uh yeah, I, I just love when I go, I, I love to set my boxes like, you know, near a tombstone. And it's it's amazing how many times I've asked, you know, whomever's there to tell me the, the name on the on the marker, whether it's that person or not. I don't know. But, uh, you know, the names will just like, you know, come off and it'll come through the device. And I've I've I have a few cemeteries that I frequent uh, quite often. And I, I kind of use them as like testing grounds for new equipment, you know, as far as like my ITC devices. So. With that box, do you find it's more like a communication style? Because, you know, if you just have a recorder and you're trying to get an EVP, I mean, you might spend all night just talking into silence, you know, and go check it later, yeah. or you're doing a lot of rewinding and playing. Do you feel like it's a, a more of a direct communication? Yeah, you know, especially if you have a device that you are... Um you're really in tune with as far as like how it sounds and you're, you get really good at discerning the phrases when they come through and not to say that you're going to hear every little thing, but when you're really familiar with it, you kind of, you, you know what it sounds like when it sounds different. And a lot of times with the ITC responses, they sound more divorced from just the, the chatter and the sweeping sound. So uh, when those, those uh, replies jump out, I mean, you really have an opportunity to have more of a, a conversational style, you know, uh, exchange with, you know, whatever might be there. So I, I've, I've documented that uh, numerous videos, numerous times. Uh, and I think that's one of the more satisfactory things I, you know, things I like about it is just having that instantaneous, like I'm getting uh, intelligent replies in the here and now. And, you know, I'm being directly, um, uh, addressed so it's it's pretty amazing it's an amazing feeling and at times it's it's almost been like you know magical some of the things that have happened and so yeah i'm i'm, I'm really i get geeked out about it 
it's all very interesting. You know, I, I, I love to ask questions about it all just because I've never, I've never had much experience with it. Um, the only time I can think of, this is back when I was doing whispers, I had a, an event that I had put on at the West Virginia penitentiary here and somebody, I don't know if it was a newer version of a ghost box or spirit box, but it literally just like was sitting there like, a e ah oh you know and it was just making these random syllables out there and, and for me it was annoying you know but yeah um but i feel yeah. like you know what's out there now in this new technology it's a lot different than than that yeah you know they are annoying i mean i, I completely <laughs> understand when some, <laughs> when somebody does not like listening to a ghost box i mean it's it can be painful uh but you know with enough time and patience you know you and different devices you kind of find you know what might work for you but you know some of the cool things that are out there as far as like trying to add credibility to using those types of devices uh, my my favorite thing right now is actually reverse speech so when you get a device that is a sweeping uh, radio ghost box and it's going through, let's, let's say, the AM band of, of the radio, and when the, the device itself is taking, you know, like sections or, you know, it's taking that audio signal and reversing the audio as it comes through the speaker, and when you're or talking to it and you know how reverse audio sounds it sounds crazy yeah, yeah. but when you start getting direct answers in, in forward speech it makes it that much more credible yeah, that's in intense. my mind so it is intense absolutely and and so to me that just it's another little thing to add to uh that approach that just gives that method i think more more credibility you know it's it's so. Uh, do you ever have you ever uh, investigated with like a spirit medium? No. No. Okay. Uh, and a lot of people do that, and you know, I, I don't have I don't have a problem with it at all. But just for like you know uh, illustration, um, I think you know people talk about ghost boxes as being like fal false positive generators, uh, where I think we're all inherently very biased, and when we are going into a, a paranormal or a haunted location, I mean, and we're looking for you know that experience and we're our expectation is there and we're we're trying to connect with you know ghosts or spirits or angels or whatever your your flavor is <laughs> and and uh, people will uh, bring mediums with them and you know here we are we're talking about an imperfect human who you know it's so hard not to throw your bias into yeah. anything and uh mediums get things wrong all the time but that doesn't mean that during a um, in an investigation that some of their wrong hits might kind of derail the course of the investigation if you if you if you uh, lean too heavily on it but mediums also get a lot of things right too and I think it's kind of the same thing with ghost boxes you just have to be very discerning in the stuff that you hear but when something is directly in, an intelligent response you just I mean, you have a hard time just being completely dismissive of it, dismissive of it. I mean, you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater like every time, you know. So uh, it's just, I think, one of those tools that we can add to uh, an investigation, but it shouldn't really be the whole investigation, I don't think. Uh, now, that kind of leads me into something that you do, and I don't know if you want to talk about this later or not, but the the cabin sessions. Oh, yeah. Share a little bit about that and how you do that, because I think it kind of ties in. Yeah, because you know, I, I think like I told you before, I'm myself. I'm I'm a skeptical believer with all this stuff, so uh, I'm always trying to find different experiments to kind of push the envelope with ITC just to you know check myself before I wreck myself, so to speak. <laughs> so <laughs> check it, and uh, check it. I, I never, yeah. <laughs> I've never tried to do what I can I call like a, a controlled radio um, a control ITC experiment uh, and by control I mean with like certain parameters set in front of it I've always been more like on a location doing a type of you know doing experiments so last year I set out to do an eight-week experiment where I uh, I had a set uh, a set question list and I used the same device and I tried to do the sessions at the same time. Uh, and I did this for eight weeks straight. 
And I would ask the same questions just to see if there would be any consistencies to the answers from like week to week to week. And I would also have for every session I did, I would add like two bonus questions and I had some trigger objects around me and so forth too. And then I would also have like one like written question that I would just hold up a piece of paper and ask for a reply to that question as well. And it was pretty interesting, you know, by the end of it, um, you know, I, I wasn't completely satisfied and I know like scientifically speaking, it wasn't, you know, perfect because, you know, it's only like, you know, quote unquote, so controlled, uh, you know, but uh, it, it was really telling to me on how, um, I seemed like I really frustrated whatever I was in contact with because as the sessions went on, things got a little bit weirder, a little bit darker, and there were, you know, refusals to answer like certain questions, especially when I kind of leaned more into um, anything dealing with like, you know, religious type of, uh, of ideas. So it was, it was really strange the, the way that it ended up. But at the same time, I think in almost every video I ask, or every session I ask what shirt I was wearing or the color of my shirt or whatever. Uh -huh. And I think that was like the one question that got answered every freaking session. Really? Uh, everything like one time. Yeah. I, one time I was wearing like a plaid shirt and it said plaid <laughs> and I just wore like a series of t-shirt and tell me the t-shirt color. And one time I, I went, I went top plus Jordan. Oh, I went, you <laughs> dirty, I went dirty, no dirty dog. You, <laughs> Yeah. The sexy I, I session. No shirt on, and it, <laughs> it it told me I had no shirt on. Really? So, yeah. So it, it was it was it was pretty wild. I mean, it, it was it was really interesting. So I'm going to do something similar uh, this year, but I'm I'm going to do it uh, on a monthly basis. So um, that obviously it's going to take me all year to kind of put it out. But um, yeah, so it's kind of a just an interesting interesting way of kind of testing your your ideas and concepts and how this whole thing you know as far as like itc how it might actually work and be applicable in an investigation that's a pretty clever way you don't really hear too many people doing like that kind of experimentation with it so uh, hats off to you for thinking of it well you know i got the idea of doing the controlled sessions when uh it was during like the whole covid lockdown thing uh steve uh halte briefly did a podcast with another ITC researcher, Bruce Halliday, and they're the ones that first brought up the idea of doing controlled sessions. I was like, well, heck, I need to, I need to try that because it was something that I never even, never even did. So I got I to gotta give those guys credit for putting that uh, idea in my head. So Now, I, I want to give you a chance to, to talk about like, what you do now because it's not just investigations. Like, tell me about paraholics.com. You know, tell me about what that is and, and what you try to do there. Well, paraholics.com is kind of like my, my, my flagship as far as like where I try to uh, dump all my paranormal experiences and so forth. So it's kind of like, you know, it's an art, my personal archive or diary that I kind of share with the world. And from the very first time I kind of set out my own and with the whole paraholics uh, concept, um, uh, that's just where I, I put everything, my random thoughts, my experiences. It's not like, you know, too much of a dear diary at all. Uh, but, you know, and also some of my rants, things that, uh, you know, I question and so forth. I, I just put it all there and it's it's linked to all my social media. So my Instagram, Twitter, my YouTube channel. So almost every, every post also has an, a, a YouTube video that's embedded in it. Uh, that kind of will go into obviously more in depth into you know where I was the the history of where I was and and any type of uh, paranormal type of experiences that I had or things that I've debunked I've uh, I've even been to investigations I've caught people like faking evidence and Ooh. I put it all out there on the blog you know for people to see so yeah that, that uh, the one time that happened was pretty darn funny I have to admit. Um, you, you want to hear that story? Oh, right? yes, I do. Okay. So as open as I am about ghost boxes, there's one piece of equipment out there that just kind of irritates the, the tar out of me, and that, that is the uh, SLS camera. You know, the camera that you see in a lot of the shows where people map out the, the stick figures and so forth? Oh, yeah. Okay, so I, I had one of those when they first came out, and – you know, I approached it just as I approach any piece of equipment. I'm, you know, skeptical, but also I try to keep an open mind. And so I, I used it a lot in the beginning. 
And so I had that, uh, that camera with me one time and myself and my buddy, Mike Caldwell, who's a retired chief of detectives in Southern Indiana, we got contacted by another, um, a paranormal group that had been investigating this house in Southern Indiana, uh, that they claimed to be, um, they were being terrorized by by a uh, demon in the house and they had a young daughter who had nicknamed the demon Elmo and so mm. you know we, we were asked to come and assist in, in this investigation and um, so I went down there we met the, the husband and wife of the other team and uh, we met with the homeowners and they kind of walked us through and they were showing us uh, you know the different you know claims and activity in the house and so forth and the homeowners left us alone for a while just to do some investigating where we set up and we did some experiments, you know, the typical EVPs and so forth. And it was totally quiet. There was nothing about the house that made us feel creeped out or whatever. And then we wanted the homeowners to come back in and sit in some sessions just to see if that caused a different, you know, a change in the atmosphere, so to speak. Yeah. And one of, one of the big claims uh, that, <laughs> that these people had was they couldn't keep any change in the house because um, Elmo the demon loved to throw pennies. He loved to throw any type of change. So of course, one of the first things I did is I went around with pocket change and I started making little piles of coins because I was trying to get a, a coin to be thrown at me, you know. Oh, yeah. And nothing ever happened. Yeah, nothing ever happened, and so forth. But when the homeowners came back and they um, they they came, everybody sat in the living room except for me. Um, they, uh, you know, we were going to do like an EVP session with them in the house. So I went to the far corner of the room with this SLS camera, which, you know, can see in the dark. And I think what kind of like duped them a little bit, and I wasn't purposely trying to do anything, but what they, they didn't recognize was the device in my hand was a camera uh, because it looks more like a tablet with a handle, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think they realized that I was actually filming. So I go around their pool table and there on the other side of the pool table was a, a, one of those uh, it was a slot machine like an antique slot machine which was it was a beautiful piece but what caught my eye was the tray uh, for the tokens was completely full of tokens and it just it hit me like a ton of bricks it's like I guess Elmo only throws American currency mm -hmm. and will not throw slot machine tokens you know I had that fleeting thought when I saw those coins there because I, I kind of found it a little you know, dumbfounded. I was dumbfounded. Like, why were these, you know, laying in here, you know, but I didn't say anything. And we started uh, our session and I'm uh, filming towards these people with this SLS camera and uh, we're asking questions. And I see the husband reach in his pocket, pull something out, hands it to the wife. And she takes her arm and throws it behind her. And all we could hear was like coin sitting all over the, the hardwood floors. And of course the investigators, everybody starts screaming and I'm in the corner just dying trying not to bust out laughing because <laughs> you're watching it all and, oh yeah i watched it all unfold and and you know after that intense moment that intense interaction with the demon elmo you know everybody had to take a break because that was some pretty powerful stuff right and you know the other investigators they're out in the the driveway and i go out there and you know i'm like loading up my stuff and they're like you know they're trying to figure out what to do next like you know what, what are we going to do about this freaking coin throwing the demon i'm like you guys can do what you want but i'm going home and i told them what i saw and they're like you have got to be kidding me <laughs> so i have a you know attack of the demon elmo uh, post up on my blog so it's pretty <laughs> funny the footage now did they SLS stay did there, they stay so. and investigate or were no, they, they checked out well, too no no we 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 were polite and as far as like making our exit you know but uh yeah we we proved well everybody wrapped up pretty shortly after that so we didn't like call them out there on the spot, but um, yeah, it was, it was pretty funny. People will do anything for a little bit of notoriety and fame in this day and age. So it, it was it, a good time. It, <laughs> please, please tell me you just, you were able to send that video to be like, Hey, I think we, we found where Elmo is and, and sent that. They, did you, did you, or are you a something. kinder man? <laughs> well, I mean, the, the blog post definitely calls them out, but um, I, I do know that my my buddy the my buddy Mike did send them a letter and basically let them know how you know we didn't appreciate being you know jerked around 
but they were so, I think they got really weirded out because I think they knew that something was up when we were packing up because the wife even started telling me the stories on sometimes how the demon Elmo will turn on their TV. And, and while she's telling this to me, I see her take her phone. I mean, like, you know, like I wouldn't know that there are apps on our smartphone that will interact with TVs. Oh. And she like turns on her TV off her phone oh. and tries to look at me like, you know, she's all bewildered. Like, how did that happen? I'm like, I cannot believe this is my life right now. <laughs> <laughs> so oh. yeah, it was a pretty amazing evening. No. I love ghost hunting. I had, this is back when I, I think we first started when, when Nick and I had a group, uh, w- that's actually where whispers came from is wheeling society of paranormal research wspr whisper um nice we uh we're doing this house and this lady thought that our mom was coming to visit every time i i think of my mom and whenever my mom's coming to visit me all i smell is lemons well sure enough she forgot her lemon fle- lemon fresh pine saw right on the top of the counter when we came in i was like well i think i found your mom uh <laughs> When's the last time you cleaned? All right. Yeah, when's the last yeah. time you heard your heard was from your, your mom? Oh, okay. Was your mom's name Dusty by chance? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, funny. People are special. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah, but the, you know the whole LL, SLS camera thing. The reason I get so frustrated with them because I I, I I I take swipes at them all the time on the vlog, and that's because I quickly learned that if you take about any flat surface it doesn't have to be flat but flat definitely helps you if you know how to hold those cameras just right you can create those stick figures on about any surface so once i figured that i figured that out it's like you know uh it just really made me question you know anytime that you would see any of that especially like on the paranormal shows because if you notice um when those stick figures appear they're always on a flat surface and the stick figure will normally be about the same dimensions as the surface. So if you get a stick man on a refrigerator, guess what? That ghost is the size of your uh, uh, frigid air. So it's kind of the way that works. So it's, it can be a very kind of, um, you know, especially if you're, if you're, if you're not aware, it can, you can really dupe yourself into talking a long time to appliances and cabinets and walls. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so just in case anybody asks you, why does uh, Matthew Jackson hate SLS cams that you can tell them? <clears throat> now you, with your blog, you also have YouTube. Are they connected? Like, do you just connect it to YouTube videos or do you have a YouTube channel? I do have a YouTube channel. It's uh Paraholics, and that's, it's all connected to uh, my blog. So for every video out there, there's a blog post that goes with it. And that's probably been one of the more frustrating things because people are so uh, geared towards, you know, the visual of like the internet, people don't like to read as much. And when I, when I do my presentations, I, I like to write as well. So to me, it's always like one piece or, you know, it's the entire, you know, uh, presentation. It's, it's the blog with the video. So if you just see the video, I always encourage people to at least check out the blog and you'll get a little bit more of a rounded, you know, uh, idea of what I was trying to present. And it's usually like on the blog is where I have my timelines as far as like for the investigations and the locations and uh, just more facts that kind of go with it. Cause okay. you know, you, you can get pretty, pretty long winded with actual just, you know, videos. If you try to throw all that into one, you know, one 15, 30 minute video, it's almost impossible. So it's like one story, but on, you know, split up into two separate medium. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say so. Now, what are you working on now? Right now I am finishing up a video from when I visited Ashmore state, excuse me, when I finished, uh, when I investigated Ashmore states back in September. So I'm, I'm currently working on that and I hope that to have that posted sometime this week. So can you you talk about what happened there or did anything happen there? Uh, Yeah. You know, actually, Ashmore States has got a really cool history. I mean, it started out off as the Coles County Poor Farm, uh, which was a poor farm for a very long time. And then, you know, probably the late 50s, I think, if I remember correctly, uh, that's when poor farms kind of went away because of, you know, Medicare and different, dis- you know, or Medicaid, different types of government assistance came through. Now, is that through. close so, to you? Is that uh, is that by where you live? 
Um, it's it's about two hours away. Okay. For me, okay. so it's not far. Um, so when, once poor farms went away, you know, we had these giant structures out in the middle of, you know, almost every county had a poor farm at one point. And so, uh, Ashmore States, it became a psychiatric hospital and it was that for a long time as well till it was eventually shut down by the state due to like, you know, poor conditions, just like, you know, most asylums eventually were. So I think it's a really unique, uh, you know, opportunity that we have as paranormal investigators to be able to go into the structures like that to still stand. And, you know, I have to say with my experiences at Ashmore, I think I really uh, got good uh, captures that related to the poor farm era as well as the psychiatric hospital era. So really? there's a, definitely a mix there of the, the tragic history that would have happened in that place. So, um, yeah, pretty, pretty incredible spot. I, I got some really relevant, um, you know, direct uh, replies, some those creepy, creepy EVPs. Um, so yeah, I'm anxious to get the video out there. And then, uh, how, how long does it usually take after an investigation? Do you have your stuff up? Oh my gosh. It just really depends on my life. So, uh, I'm really embarrassed. It's taken me from September until ah. now to get the video almost done. But, uh, I had a couple other things pop up in between that, you know, are, are still undisclosed at this point. I really can't talk about or share that I had to like jump on. So it kind of pushed Ashmore, uh, on the back burner a little bit. So I'm, I'm really trying to get ramped up and get to posting more regularly. Cause I think the last time I posted was, well, well, I, I told you about the Herb Baumeister post, um, you know, from the, the Fox Hollow Farm and the, uh, um, I think that was the last post I actually put up on the blog and that was uh, late last year. So, Oh, uh, Herb. Um, okay. So for whatever reason that just put back a memory, we were talking about faked, uh, investigations. Yes. We had a, a guy and I did it. This is another event I did at the penitentiary and, uh, I had a big event investigator. His name was Herb. I'm not going to give away his last name, but <laughs> he he faked so much. And, and, like, he would just have his – he's like, this is my method. And he would, like, just talk into his recorder and, like, throw it out there and play it right back and be like, you hear that? You hear that? They said yes. <laughs> I'm like, you are a lunatic. And, uh, yeah, he was something else. But I had him – I brought him in to that investigation. <laughs> I was like, oh, wow. I can't believe this person right now. I don't want to out their I, last I name, but I'm sure you can Google Herb and his method. I, I, I tell you what, there's nothing scarier in the paranormal than the living. I, I don't know about you, but nothing I've really encountered in the dark has ever freaked me out as much as some of the, <laughs> the great folks I've met in this, <laughs> in this field, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I'm some all, of my best friends are terrifying. <laughs> I'm I'm all about like para unity and stuff like that, and we shouldn't talk about other investigators and you know some, but some of them are bad. <laughs> some of them do yeah, not good. Some stuff. of them are bad, man. <laughs> all right, but uh, you're talking about a different kind of herb. Is he a better person? Who's yeah. this herb that you were talking about? He he might be a great paranormal researcher because I have a feeling that sadly he made a lot of ghosts. Oh, and, I mean that's a bad joke and poor taste. But let me tell you, he's one of the most prolific serial killers in United States history. So uh, yeah, her Baumeister, um, he had a house on the north side of uh, Indianapolis. And um, the, the people know it as Fox Hollow Farm. It's been well documented on you know. Uh, as far as the history of that place and the number of people that, uh, that met their untimely end there. And not only that, a lot of people also think that before he started bringing victims back to Fox Hollow Farm to kill them, he uh, spent a number of years actually picking up um, – he would pick up gay men uh, at some of the local Indianapolis um, uh, gay bars. And for a while, there was a another serial killer that – uh, they called the I-70 Strangler. Mm -hmm. And they were finding these bodies of, of gay men in between Indianapolis and Columbus, Ohio. And they were all connected to the Indianapolis uh, gay community. And oddly enough, those murders stopped at the same time that Herb purchased Fox Hollow Farm. 
and things were quiet for a while um, until, except for people were still disappearing and those people were not found until he was busted at Fox Hollow Farm. So he had a long history of, um, you know, murder and mayhem. I mean, it's really, really uh, tragic, sick stuff. But I had the opportunity a few years ago to actually go to his house and do an investigation. Oh, and then wow. recently I, I went to his hunting ground, essentially, to one of the bars where he picked up a lot of his victims. Now, you got to tell me, what kind of evidence did you get at that house? Were you just visiting the house? Like, did you just get to go see the house and tour it, or did you get to do, like, an investigation? Oh, it was an investigation. Um, the one EVP that I will never forget to this day, it's one of the most uh, traumatic, bone-chilling EVPs that I've ever captured, was uh, I was in the house with two other investigators were with me, and uh, they're, they're part of the ghost lore that you hear there is – uh, Herb himself likes to hang out in, in his house and uh, stand in his bathroom and there's a big window in his bathroom that uh, overlooks into the woods where he had a lot of his victims piled up and you know people you know they they hypothesize that he stands there in kind of admiration or looking over his uh, his handiwork you know and so the ghost of Herb has been seen in this window and of course, I don't know if any of that's true. I'm just in there and I'm doing an EVP session and we're standing in this bathroom and we start hearing what sounds like footsteps walking around the master bedroom. Um, you know, it's pretty heavy, like thumps and thuds. And, and I'm like inviting whatever's out there to come talk to us in this bathroom. And I we all stepped aside away from the door, invited whatever was in. And there was just like this, this heaviness to that moment and I asked if there was someone in there with me and I have a class A EVP that says the killer oh. and when we yeah when we reviewed that uh, you know uh, sometime after those sessions down in the basement I mean we were, we were all just absolutely floored but with my ghost boxes I got the names of some of the victims that were found or re their bodies were recovered at Fox Hollow Farm. Um, and a lot of real, uh, I'm just going to say, it's like homoerotic, suggestive uh, ITC responses, you know. And when you get like very explicit, you know, words that are not going to be on the radio. It's not usually I mean, on the radio. Those type of things are. Yeah, not you know, NPR is not only going to go so far. <laughs> <laughs> so, so whenever you give you know responses like that in the location and you tie it to the history, it's really hard to dismiss. So it's it was it was a it was a wild wild evening. That is incredible. Um, now I've heard I actually just yeah. recently heard a story uh, about him in that house that uh, the new owners you know some of the new owners were in and and saw a lot of you know, physical spirits running in and out throughout the woods <clears> there and, and, and that area. Did you get a chance to go out into the woods where the bodies were, were found? Because there were a lot of bodies found. Yeah, yeah, uh, we did. Um, and that's that's in my, my video of us going out to the woods there that uh, um, they called it like, I think they called it like Herb's Burn Pile. Uh, we were out there and that's where a lot of the bones and stuff were recovered. Um, got to meet the homeowners, uh, incredibly nice guy that owns the place. Uh, he was very helpful as far as like, you know, giving us, he gave us a great tour of the house and the property. And, uh, he, of course, you know, he got a great deal. <laughs> he got a great deal when he bought <laughs> the place. Imagine. Um, and, and they, they, they found out the history before they, they, you know, the purchase was, uh, was, was finished and they had a big debate as a family on whether or not they were going to live in this house. Ooh, and he kind of took the attitude of, yeah, he, he took the attitude like he wasn't going to let the history bother him. But, you know, sometimes his, history has a tendency to speak for itself. And so they have had experiences, mainly like his wife and, and kids. But he had a, uh, a book, like a scrapbook that he put together of a lot of the crime scene photos and the, from the police investigations and, and so forth. So he, he's kind of made a little bit of a hobby, just kind of, um, you know, putting all that constructing that story and keeping it and archiving it and if they find bones to this day on that property he's got a great working relationship with the forensics department at the uh, university of indianapolis 
I mean, he doesn't even call the police anymore. He'll just take the bones and drive them down and drop them off because there's still a number of victims that they've not been able to identify yet. So there, wow. it's still an ongoing, and you know, the story is not done. So now, is, yeah, are pretty, they still finding crazy, new tragic? Are are they still finding new bodies, or are these bones of you know previous victims? No. These are bones of previous victims. Well, I, I don't yeah, mean. Sorry, let me let me rephrase that. I don't questions. mean like brand new. <laughs> like he's he's out there slaughtering now. I mean like uh, bodies that haven't previously been found. Yeah, I think Herb crushed a lot of the bones up. Okay. Um, and and a lot of animals uh would grab um you know bones or, or remains and like scurry off with them. And uh, I I think I think there might be like seventeen acres there. Uh, so, I mean, just randomly throughout, you know, the property, they have found, uh, you know, bones and, and they, they turn them in. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I can, I cannot imagine living there. I was about to say, what, what if you had the opportunity to, uh, move into that house? Would you take that? Um, man, I don't know. It's no. too big. Uh, that oh, that's the, would be that's terrible. That's the problem. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, unless some of my ghost friends know how to mow and vacuum and mop, I'm just not interested. Could you imagine the electric bill? The heating bill would be insane. <laughs> the, not, not the serial killer in the put bathroom. Me, <laughs> put me in a in, in a in a wigwam, you know, uh, with 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 no power, and I could probably handle that. But too much maintenance for me, man. Oh my gosh, that's enough. Yeah. Now, what about yeah. the bar? When you so, were at the bar, did you get anything at the bar? I did. I did. I, I got some really tragic replies. And, and you know, if you wanted to construct a narrative from some of the uh, exchanges that I had in this bar, it seemed like um, there, were, um, there, there were spirits that are there that are trying to keep Herb out. I mean, it was really strange. They seemed very protective of their space. And they were familiar with Herb and wanted absolutely nothing to do with him. And there were even some ITC replies that came through that were talking about uh, stabbing and uh, it said ice pick and various things like that, which made no sense in the moment. And after actually you know, some help with some of the research came across, there was actually another serial killer uh, that kind of crossed the timeline uh, alongside with Herb. Um, his name was Larry Eiler and Larry Eiler was kind of the same thing. He was picking up, you know, gay men at these clubs and bars around Indiana and Illinois. And, but instead of just like strangling them and leaving them on the side of the road, he was like, he was stabbing them to death and doing just gruesome things to them. And uh, wow. a couple people survived Larry Eiler's attacks. You know, these are you know gay men that he picked up at a bar and they were able to get away and in some of the testimony, they talked about how when they came to there, right beside them were knives and ice picks. So it even made me kind of wonder if some of the ITC replies that I got out of that bar, if some of those you know, people that were there, if this may have been the last place that they were uh, when they were alive and happy before tra tragedy struck them, if they were given some clues as to you know, what happened to them you know, a little bit later. So it's pretty creepy to think about, but it makes you wonder. I don't think there's any mistakes, um, you know, when I, you, you find a connection like that. Yeah, that's pretty intense too. You know, yeah. finding, you know, one spot, doing an investigation with multiple serial killer victims, like with, with different killers. Yeah, and at one point I know we asked if Herb was there, you know, at the bar and we got a uh, an ITC reply that said Herb's at Fox Hollow Farm, which kind of lends some credibility to the killer being in the bathroom with me that one time. So, you know, when, when you've been involved in paranormal for a while and you get to go in some of these uh, fantastic locations and you start to build like a body of work, it's interesting to kind of go back, like look at your, your blog or your YouTube channel, whatever, and just kind of lay it all out and see, you know, all the amazing, crazy opportunities and and you know, things that you've experienced and you start to see like, you know, the web of, you know, connection throughout, uh, you know, throughout your, your adventures and research. So it's, it's, it's pretty cool that I've, I've been able to touch some of these places just, 
you know, because primarily I'm just here in the, in the Midwest, you know, I'm not jet setting all over the world or anything like that. So, yeah. um, it's pr- pretty, pretty cool to be able to have all that and to be able to talk about it. Now, I think the, the story that I had heard, and it's from, if you guys want to look it up, it's from Mr. Ballin on YouTube. And I, I love, yeah. I love listening to his stories. I think I just posted about it in, in my Facebook group. Um, with his, you know, there was an EVP done, you know, in that house. I can't remember off the top of my head where, but he said, you know, who is this? And the the recording said the married one. And they went back through, mm. and the only one that was married was Herb. You know, Herb wow. was Herb was <clears throat> married, yeah, and, and had a kid or had kids. Yeah. Huh. Well, yeah, I I, I think that would be accurate because most, I think, almost all the the men that were identified as victims, they were, they were single and a lot of them pretty young too. So really, really sad. Woo. Crazy stuff. Yeah, Matt, we're really talking is. about I, the crazy I, stuff. Yes. All right. So how, how can folks get in touch with you if they want to, you know, reach out to you, talk to you, what's the best way to get a hold of Mr. Matthew Jack? Uh, well, you can go to paraholics.com. <laughs> <laughs> and from there, you can you know scroll down, and you can find me on, like I said, Twitter, uh, Instagram, uh, Facebook. You know, I have I have a presence on all those platforms, and you can just hit the message button on any of those, and I will eventually see it, and I will get back to anyone who sends me a message. So, there we go, Matt. I want to thank you yep. so much for joining us tonight. Uh, as always, hey, it is a pleasure. pleasure. It is a, a pleasure talking with you, and thank you for the kind words at the beginning of the show. Um, that means a lot. Hey, man. Uh, you know, you and your work has meant a lot to me, too, man. So I appreciate that you're doing this again, and uh, I'm going to do my part to keep uh, uh, telling everyone about uh, Fireside. Thank you. You are awesome. And everybody should do that, too. Do what Matt does. Tell everybody about <laughs> Fireside. <laughs> <laughs> You know, my mama tried to work on me, man, but it's kind of weird for me to be a good example. So, uh, (laughs) (laughs) hey, Matt, thank you so much for coming on, and I do appreciate you. And you have a wonderful night. Hey, thank you, sir. Hey, you too. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. And with that, the fire is out. I want to thank you guys so much for joining me this week. Uh, Another thank you to Matt Jackson. I want to remind everybody to jump on our. Uh, social medias out there you know we have our facebook group fireside paranormal hub we have our instagram twitter our twitter is fireside parapod p-a-r-a-p-o-d we are on tiktok having a lot of fun on that we have our patreon remember we're just setting up that patreon so uh, you can get a name drop you can get access to our discord server i hope to make that uh, into something fun just another way we can uh, connect and you know discuss the show or or different ideas that we have. Make sure to check out our website, firesideparanormal.com. Now, on that, we do have these shows. We also have our merch section. We got all kinds of fun merch out there. I mean, there's pillows, cups, tablets, phone cases, uh, big tapestries, wall art. I mean, there's so much stuff with the designs on there. It's definitely worth checking out. Make sure you look up American Paranormal Magazine with the January issue because I'm on it. And if you do want to reach out to me, if you have a story or if you want to be a guest on the show, don't hesitate to send me an email, firesideparanormalpodcast at gmail.com or message me on any of my social media platforms. I check all those. And until next week, everybody, don't be afraid, only believe.